Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. My name is Trevor McKay, and I'm the president of the William F. Buckley Jr. Program at Yale. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's event featuring Mr. Carl Rove to speak on, if you think it's bad today, it's been worse before. Before I introduce our guest, I'd like to say a few words about the Buckley Program. The William F. Buckley Jr. Program is the flagship program of the Buckley Institute, an organization dedicated to promoting intellectual diversity and open political discussion at Yale. We have hosted lectures, dinner seminars, firing line debates, and an annual conference every year since 2011. Our over 700 Buckley Fellows hold a wide range of political beliefs, but they all stand united against the formation of a liberal-only echo chamber on campus. By providing Yale students with a forum to engage meaningfully with serious conservative thought, the Buckley program has become an institution on Yale's campus and a symbol for a more open and representative political atmosphere, especially at a university where the mission is the cultivation and creation of new knowledge Buckley Fellows believe that all perspectives must be heard and examined in good faith. You can learn more about the program and how to become a Buckley Fellow on our website at buckleyinstitute.com. I also want to emphasize the Buckley Program's commitment to freedom of speech. Disruption of an event is not consistent with Yale's policies on free expression as outlined in the Woodward Report. I would ask that each of you respect the right of our speaker to be heard and the right of your fellow audience members to listen to the event. Thank you for joining us in upholding the value of free speech. And now, this afternoon's guest. Mr. Carl Rove served as senior advisor to President George W. Bush from 2007, or 2000 to 2007, and deputy chief of staff from 2004 to 2007. At the White House, he oversaw the offices of strategic initiatives, political affairs, public liaison, and intergovernmental affairs, and also was deputy chief of staff for policy, coordinating the White House policy making process. A Colorado native, he attended the University of Utah, the University of Maryland College Park, George Mason University, and the University of Texas at Austin. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Carl Rove to Yale. Thank you, Thank you, buddy. Thank you. What he forgot to mention is after that long list of universities, I never got my degree. <laughs> I, was the, I was in the last generation that could get away with that stupidity, but I, I do teach at the University of Texas at Austin. And I must say, it's a hell of a class that I teach. So if you want to come down and learn about the modern American presidential campaign, come and we'll work your ass off. Um, when I was in college, William F. Buckley came to the University of Utah. And I got to be part of the host committee. And uh, I'll never forget meeting the great man. And uh, I must admit, uh, it was spectacular. We had a local university professor. Uh, debate him, and uh, as I recall, he didn't do too well. Uh, Buckley chewed him up one side and down the other very pleasantly. Uh, but afterwards, we went out to dinner with him, and I have to say, part of the uh, luster wore off because he had the worst breath of any human being I think I'd ever <laughs> met. You may be also unaware that Buckley has a Texas connection. The Buckley money comes from oil in South Texas, near Laredo. and. Uh, Back when they hunted Republicans in Texas with dogs, one of the leaders of our party was a woman named Buckley. She was his cousin, and uh, Beryl Buckley Milburn. And uh, it wasn't too long ago that that, that was the case, that they, uh, Republicans were a, a distinct minority in Texas. We're only on our fourth Republican governor in the history of Texas. And we're on our third Republican U.S. Senator and our, and our, our uh, fourth Republican U.S. Senator in the history of the state. So not, uh, not too long ago, we were Democrats. Um, my topic today, and I'm going to uh, speak uh, for a while and then answer or duck your questions. Uh, and no, I don't have a whiteboard because they don't travel well, and I'm going to be on the road for four days. So I'm going to use the blackboard if need be to drive home a point. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm mystified as to, to why we're in the situation that we're in, that we're looking at the politics of today and thinking we're in some place really unusual and special. It's a bad place, don't get me wrong. Our parties are broken. Our political system is dysfunctional. We got two of the worst choices we could possibly have. About 60% of the American people don't want either one of these guys running. One of them is uh, angry about having lost the last election. The other guy is just sort of lost. 
<laughs> but my, my point today is to say it's been worse before. And we do ourselves no good by thinking that this is some unusual place that, uh, that uh, is, is uh, unique. Some in this room, none of the Yale students will remember, but some in this room will remember when it was bad, when it was worse. We're talking about the late 1960s and the early 70s. Some of you were around then. The peaceful protests over racial integration of the 50s had been met in many places by official response of violence. And by the early 60s, it was coming apart. 1964, Harlem, followed by Philadelphia. 1965, the great riot in Watts, the lurid sky over Los Angeles for day after day as the city was in flames. The long hot summer of 1967, 163 American cities suffered massive protests and violence. Atlanta, Boston, Buffalo, Cincinnati, Detroit, Milwaukee, Newark, New York City, Portland, Oregon. And then there was April 4th, 1968, the brutal assassination of Martin Luther King. And within hours, 130 American cities are in flames and 47 Americans die in the riots. Two months later, Robert Kennedy is set assassinated in Los Angeles after winning the California Democratic presidential primary. 1968, there was a bigot on the ballot, George Corley Wallace. And he carried five states as an independent candidate for president. Four years later, he ran for the Democratic nomination for president and got 1.8% fewer votes than the eventual winner, George McGovern. Think about that. Our politics was broken. You know, at, uh, if it wasn't one thing, it was another. Starting in 1965, there were riots under an unpopular war over an unpopular war in Southeast Asia. And by 1970, governors were routinely calling out the National Guard in order to return um, campuses to a peaceful nature. However, it wasn't so peaceful in Kent State when four students were killed. And within hours, 350 American campuses were occupied by an estimated 2 million student protesters. In October of 1967, 35,000 protesters tried to shut down the Pentagon. 10,000 protesters were in Grant Park in 1968 attempting to shut down the Democratic National Convention. Four years later, 10, 10 or 15,000 protesters swarmed Collins Avenue in Miami Beach, Florida in order to shut down the Republican National Convention. First convention I went to as a 20-year-old, 19-year-old student working for the, at the Republican National Committee, I got caught up in a tear gas a barrage against the, the rioters as they attempted to break through the fence on Thursday night when President Richard Nixon arrived to give his speech accepting the Republican Party nomination. He accepted it only by being helicoptered into the facility. He couldn't drive in. So don't get me started about how bad things were because some in this room, including me, have seen worse. The 1930s. No, think about this. Think about this. How violent was the United States? In an 18-month period in 1971 and 1972, there are 2,500 bombings in the United States, five a day, by extremist groups primarily opposed to the war in Southeast Asia. And our politics was broken. We have two presidents who are forced from office. One is driven from office by his own internal angst over a very unpopular war in Vietnam. And the other one is driven from office because he's going to be impeached over a second-rate burglary of the Watergate Democratic National Committee headquarters. People thought our politics was over. You know, in desperation, we turned to this well-meaning guy from Georgia who said, I'm, an, I'm a Christian and I'm a Southerner and I'm going to restore dignity and honor to the White House. And he seemed like a good man. And we were desperate. And we sent him to the White House. And he was a good man. He is a good man. But he turned out to be weak. And the country entered a period of decline, suffering double-digit inflation, double-digit interest rates, double-digit unemployment. It looked like the Russians were on the move in Afghanistan and elsewhere around the globe. And the American people felt that we were in decline. Malaise was the word. And along came the election of 1980, in which uh, the incumbent, 
uh, was in danger and was in trouble, but he had an opponent who seemed untested and too conservative and too radical. There was one debate in 1980. And going into that debate, Jimmy Carter is ahead and Ronald Reagan is behind. But in the debate, the American people looked at these two men and heard Jimmy Carter talk about consulting his 14-year-old daughter on questions of nuclear disarmament, which seemed a little bit weird. And Reagan seemed solid, asking the question the American people were asking themselves, are you better off today than you were four years ago? And while he was, had been depicted as an extremist and as a right-winger, he seemed solid. And besides, wasn't he the governor of the most populous state in the Union? And people took a, took a chance. And in the final days of the campaign, the undecideds break decisively for Reagan, and he becomes president, and our confidence as a nation is restored, and our politics is healed. Sure, there's a disagreements between the two parties, and yes, there are battles over big, important issues, but there was a significant difference in the tone and the quality and the confidence of the American people after that election that lasted for better than two decades. 1930s. The two boys at the back running the camera, they were around in the 1930s. <laughs> but none of the rest of us were here. But think about this. One out of every four Americans was out of work. The country was racked by labor disputes, by desperate people trying to put, keep their lives together. Mass migrations, the great Okies of, 19, of the 1930s, hundreds of thousands of people leave the Dust Bowl, Kansas, Nebraska, and particularly Oklahoma, and head west, hoping to put somehow cobble together a life in California. You read the histories of the time, and it's every year, every month, there is violence and populism on the left and right. On the left, it's Huey Long, governor of Louisiana and senator from Louisiana at the same time. Every man a king, he says, take from them the got and give to them the don't. And Father Coughlin, Charles Coughlin, a Catholic priest broadcasting every night from Detroit, 50,000 watts, reaching a nationwide audience, populism on the right. It's the Jews. It's the Jews and Wall Street who are responsible for condi the condition the country finds itself in. And our politics is racked by the enormous dissent on left and right, isolationism. The Nazi, the American Bund, has a rally in Madison Square Garden. And, it, and the effort to keep America isolated and out of the conflicts in Europe is led by one of the most popular figures of the time, the aviator Charles Lindbergh, the first man to fly across the Atlantic. There's a wonderful book by Charles, by a, by a, a, a terrific historian of the era, in which he writes that having been a young journalist at the time, it was hard to, to read the newspapers or listen to the radio without hearing new news about violence of Americans on Americans, whether it was union violence against the company or the company against the union with strike breakers or uh, vigilantes on the left or right. And our country is kept together by a guy who cannot stand on his own two feet, Franklin Roosevelt. We have nothing to fear but fear itself. I see a couple of copies of the, the uh, uh, Triumph of William McKinley. Strongly recommend it to you. It's a hell of a book. <laughs> I think I did a pretty good job on it myself. But to write the book, I had to understand the politics of the Gilded Age. If you think politics today is broken, you go back to the Gilded Age. Because these people, these men, who hold public office in the United States, are fighting the Civil War again only through politics, not through, not through war. There are five presidential elections in a row after the re-election of Ulysses S. Grant. There are five presidential elections in a row in which nobody gets 50% of the vote. Three of those elections are settled by less than a percentage point between the winner and the loser. Two of them, the winner takes the Electoral College and loses the popular vote. Perhaps the best example of how bad it was is the election of 1876. On election night, the Democrat, Samuel Tilden, governor of the state of New York, is ahead by 262,000 votes, which for that time was a huge margin. But there's a question about the votes cast in South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana, where a majority of the eligible voters are black men, overwhelmingly Republican, and yet all three states have fallen to the Democrats. How? By violence that is impossible for the modern mind to understand. 
And this goes on for, for decades. In 1896, Mr. McKinley is the nominee of the Republican Party, and 60% of the eligible voters in Mississippi are black men, and he gets 6% of the vote in Mississippi. You do the math. There is no election after 1872 in, in which people do not die because they are black and want to vote. In 1874, the Democrats take control of the House of Representatives for the first time in 18 years, and they do so by electing 54 former Confederate generals and government officials, including the Vice President of the Confederacy, is sitting in the U.S. House of Representatives. And these men hate each other, and they do anything they can to gain power. Remember a couple of years ago, there was the woman in eastern Iowa who won by seven votes, Marianna Meeks, you may remember this. Nancy Pelosi was then speaker, and she said, we may want to empower a special committee, an election committee, in order to look into the uh, election and see if she was properly elected. And then they decided after a couple of days, maybe we ought not to do that. Because in 1984, in the bloody eighth of Indiana, the Republican victor on election night underwent an election challenge and was removed by the Democratic Congress. And it poisoned the well in the House for years afterwards. Well, guess how many times between 1874 and 1904, the majority party in the U.S. House of Representatives, in order to, you know, which was narrowly divided virtually all those years, guess how many times the majority would phony up an election challenge to somebody in the minority who had won election by a small number of votes and kick them out. Now, a few of these were righteous, but most of them were completely a, a, a raw grab for power. He won re-election by a small number of votes, Let's find a way to kick him out. Guess how many times? Over 12 Congresses and 20 some odd years. Five, 10, try 61 times. In 1884, William McKinley, who has won re-election by eight votes with no expectation, no discussion, no evidence whatsoever of fraud or abuse. He had a swing district in Iowa and it went against the Republicans that year, but he won by eight votes. And he is kicked out by the Congress, and the only unusual thing about it is seven leading Democrats, including the first Democratic speaker in 18 years, vote to retain him as a mark of respect. This goes on year after year after year after year in order for the majority to gain greater leverage over the minority. It finally ends in 1904 when Congressman John Soforth of Colorado, a Democrat, stands up and says, I have paid careful attention to the deliberations of the Elections Committee, and I have come to the unfortunate conclusion that in 29 precincts in my district, that members of my party engaged in an illegal and illicit activity that resulted in my inappropriate election to the Congress. I therefore ask you to join me in voting to expel me from the House and replace me with my Republican opponent. He was elected governor two years later on the slogan of Honest John. That's what it took to break it. And if you go read the congressional record of the time, you will be astonished. Talk about a dry document, because nothing is getting done. The only things that get done are forced onto the system by exterior events. The President of the United States is assassinated three months after he's been sworn into office. And so Democrats and Republicans say he was killed by a disgruntled office seeker. Maybe we ought to begin to do something about civil service reform, and the Pendleton Act is passed. Democratic farmers and Republican farmers are saying the railroads are ripping us off. They're charging too high a price to get our product to, to market. And so together, Democrats and Republicans set up the Interstate Commerce Commission and railroad regulation. But otherwise, nothing gets done. In 1888, the Republicans take control of the White House and the Senate by one vote and the House of Representatives by four, 160 to 164. And the Democrats announced that what they're going to do is, is they are not going to allow a single bill to be passed in the House of Representatives if they can keep it that way. It's not like you've got to repeal Obamacare or we're going to shut down the government. It's if we have an opportunity to keep you from passing anything, we're going to do it. And we're going to do it by what was called the disappearing quorum. If a couple of Republican members were absent, the Democrats would do a nose count and say they're not an absolute majority of members here today voting 
on the Republican side. And so as soon as the vote was cast, they'd raise up and say, Mr. Speaker, we do not believe a quorum is president. We call for a roll call. The roll would be called. No Democrat would answer the roll call. And as a result, there wouldn't be an absolute majority of the House voting in favor of the measure, and it would be going down. And this went on in October. Back then, they were, they were, they were civilized. Swear them in in March. No air conditioning in Washington. Send everybody home. Have them come back in October or November and when, there was, when Washington cooled down and have them then vis, uh, vote. So in October of 1888 and, uh, excuse me, 1889 and November and December and January of 1890, virtually nothing gets passed through the House of Representatives because they keep having a disappearing quorum. On the 29th of January, 1890, Thomas Brackett Reed, the Speaker of the House, has had enough. Six foot three inches tall, about 300 pounds, looks like a bowling pin with a walrus mustache painted on it. One tough customer. He's had enough. So he tells the Sergeant Arms, when we have a vote on kicking out a Democrat member of Congress from West Virginia who is only there because the Democrat governor interpreted three, uh, me, two votes in a precinct as being 12 votes, thereby giving him a victory by seven votes, he said, we're going to kick him out. And when I call for the vote, take up arms at the doors of the House chamber, the same one that you see during the State of the Union, and do not allow a single member to leave after the vote. So they have the vote. They kick out the Democrat from West Virginia. A Democrat stands up from Kentucky and says, Mr. Speaker, I don't believe a quorum is present. They call the quorum. There's not an absolute majority of Republicans in the, in the, uh, in the chamber that day. And uh, Democrats are exalting because they've now flummoxed them once again. And at that, the Speaker says, I direct the clerk to show Mr. Jones present, Mr. Smith present, calls out the name of every Democrat on the floor who's not voting, and has the clerk show him. All hell breaks loose. Every Democrat makes a run for the exits. One gets out. Constantine August of Russ County, Texas, beats the crap out of the sergeant at arms and uses his cowboy boots to kick out the slats of the door and make good his escape. The Kentuckian who called for the roll call stands up and screams at Reed, under God and the Constitution, you have no right to count me present without my permission, to which Reed carefully and coolly replies, the chair is merely stating the facts, does the honorable gentleman from Kentucky deny he's present upon the floor? <laughs> this kicks off a two-day long debate over whether or not the Speaker of the House has the authority to do this. The tone is set by another Texan, William Henry Hattie Martin. Fought the entire Civil War with the famed Hood's Brigade. Six foot six inches tall, thin as a rail, mean as a snake. He stands up on the floor of the House, points a bony finger at Reed, turns to his fellow Democrats and says, if any member will order me to remove this dictator from his position of power upon the podium, I will do so by force forthwith. Reed says, the honorable gentleman from Texas is out of order and moves on. Congressman Byram of Indiana stands up and Democrat and floor leader begins to harangue Reed. Martin is pissed off. He comes up and takes a, t stands on the steps right below the speaker's podium and begins to, while B Byram is speaking, he begins to uh, hassle Reed. Tyrant, sir, tyrant! Reed pays him no attention. Finally, he stalks off saying he doesn't have any fight in him. The next day, the debate begins with Martin taking a position right in front of the speaker's podium, right there, pulls out his 16-inch long Bowie knife and proceeds to methodically sharpen it on his boot sole in order to menace the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, I do not remember Nancy Pelosi doing that with her stilettos when, we, when she had lost the speakership. I just don't. So don't tell me that it's worse today. These men hated each other. When was the first stolen election? 1824. One guy, Andrew Jackson, four-way contest, gets 41% of the vote, carries 11 states, has 99 votes in the Electoral College, only that's 33 short of a majority because the others are split up between Crawford of Georgia, Clay of Kentucky, and, the, and John Quincy Adams. And so they vote in February of 1825, and it goes to the House of Representatives where each state has one vote to be cast by the delegation of the House, and it is a lame duck Congress that is dominated by supporters of John Quincy Adams, who gets 13 states, while Andrew Jackson gets seven, because four of the states that he carried, their congressional delegation, vote for Adams. 
And for the next four years, in letters to his, his confidants and in the voices of his of supporters, the claim is it was a corrupt bargain that stole the election of 1824. Remember the uh, first time you took a history course and you may have seen the, the, the famous woodcut of Charles Sumner, the senator from Massachusetts, being caned by Congressman Brooks of South Carolina, 1856. And we sort of think of you know the 1850s as a bad period, and they were. But that wasn't the only part of the bad period. There's a brilliant book by a historian named Joanne Freeman called Field of Blood, in which she points out that it is for 30 some odd years, in part because of the 1824 election, but in the 1830s, the 40s, and the 50s, there is, it is routine for members of Congress to go onto the floor of the House or Senate armed to the teeth, carrying pistols and guns and knives and canes with, with, with specifically designed metal heads on them so they could club each other. 1838, a Kentucky Whig kills a Maine Democrat in a duel. And the issue is not even slavery. The issue is bank regulation. So for 30 years, we're hating each other over issues that to us seem not that big and not that complex, but were important to the people and politics of the time. And as Joanne Freeman said, she got a great quote. I think I got it here, in fact. The nation didn't sli slip into disunion. It fought its way into it. And not just over an existential issue, the freedom of four million of our fellow human beings. It was over everything. 1800, Thomas Jefferson, what a man. Author of the Declaration of Independence, founder of the University of Virginia, author of the Statute of Religious Liberty, third president of the United States. Do you remember that his election ended in a tie in the Electoral College? You remember that? Back then, you cast two votes. And the guy who got the biggest number of votes was president, and the guy who got the second number of votes became the vice president. And his running mate, Aaron Burr, is supposed to tell a couple of uh, the electors from New York, be sure and throw away your vote so Tommy J becomes president and I become the vice president. Jefferson writes a letter to his son-in-law. All the important stuff he, he tells his son-in-law. He says, don't worry, a couple of guys from Georgia are supposed to take care of that problem. And, Tom, and, and Aaron's going to take care of it, too. Don't worry. It's, everything's set. But on December 6, 1800, it is a tie in the Electoral College between Thomas Jefferson and his running mate because Aaron Burr has forgot to get a couple of New Yorkers to throw away their vote. It's 93-93. So it goes to the House of Representatives on February 11th of 1801 in the middle of a blinding snowstorm. Washington has been you know, caked in in snow. And the Democrats are worried because Maryland has four Democrats, and f or Republicans as, as they were then called, and four Federalists. And one of the Republicans, a Jeffersonian, is supposedly near death. Joseph of Maryland says, I'm going to vote no matter what and insists upon being carried on a stretcher two miles through a blinding snowstorm and installed in a committee room next to the House floor to be dragged out to vote, to deadlock Maryland and keep it from going for Burr who's trying to steal the presidency from his ostensible chief. They vote 27 times starting at noon. They vote almost every hour on the hour through the night and through the morning until noon the next day. And every one of them is inconclusive because Maryland is deadlocked, Vermont is deadlocked, South Carolina is deadlocked, and Burr is looking pretty strong. They decide on the second day, let's slow this sucker up. Let's see if we can't come to a resolution. Six days more, they vote, and on the 36th ballot, it finally breaks, and it breaks by the unlikely intervention of an unlikely figure, Alexander Hamilton, who's earlier written a letter to, to, to George Baird, the, the Federalist congressman from Delaware, to say, I hate him. I hate them both. But at least Jefferson has, quote, a concern for his own reputation while Burr is, quote, a man of extreme and irregular ambition. And if we vote for Burr, quote, we must share in the blame and disgrace that will follow. And on the 37th ballot, 36th ballot, Baird says, I'm walking out of here and not casting Delaware's vote. He convinces his colleagues in Vermont 
and Maryland and South Carolina to throw in the towel. And on the 36th ballot, Thomas Jefferson is elected President of the United States and sworn in 14 days later. But at least he had 14 days. Remember me mentioning 1876? The election of 1876 is settled by a commission. The House of Representatives says, we don't even want to touch this thing. It's so divisive. So we're going to empower a special commission to decide who, who won the electoral college votes of Florida, South Carolina, and Louisiana. And on the 2nd of March, 1877, the commission awards all three states to the probable winner in those states, Rutherford B. Hayes, who becomes president by a vote in the Electoral College of 185 to 184 and is sworn in two days later. So don't tell me that things are bad today and that they've never been this bad before and don't wring your hands and say we're not going to find a way out of it because inevitably we find a way out of it. Whether it is the nature of our Constitution whether it's the nature of our political system, or maybe it's a question of leadership, or maybe it's a question of the good common sense in the American people eventually making itself heard. Maybe it's a combination of all four of those things. We find our way out. So the people who sit here today and say, we've never been here before, and we've really, yeah, we haven't been exactly here, but we've been in bad places before and have found a way out. So I tell myself that every morning when I get up and read the newspaper. <laughs> With that, I'd be happy to answer uh, and duck any of your questions. Thanks for having me, and uh, appreciate you coming. We now have some time for Q&A, so if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand. I'll come bring the mic to you. Please keep your questions brief, because there's a lot of people, I'm sure, that have questions. Hello. My name is Fred Polner. I was the uh, associate head at uh, Trumbull College here. Um, so other than spending your time speaking with us here at Yale, how are you otherwise occupying your time now? Uh, I'm, I'm doing, uh, how am I occupying my time? I write a weekly column for the Wall Street Journal, 750 words due f uh, as early as possible on Wednesday morning. I'm doing Fox TV 5.1 times a week, not that anybody's counting. I'm working on my third book, which is on presidential decision making in instances where the president doesn't know something and knows he doesn't know something. Every other semester, I teach a class for 52 honor students at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, I serve, I'm the co founder of the Senate uh, Leadership Fund, the largest super PAC on the Republican side. I help form a group called Restoring Integrity and Trust in Elections, which is a sensible group to defending things like voter ID laws and so forth. Uh, has Bill Barr and Andy McCarthy on the board. Uh, I'm the head of a voter registration project in Texas that has added 500,000 new Republicans to the rolls in Texas in the last five years. And here's the really weird thing. I'm spending half of my time as a senior advisor to the CEO of a company that is building a low Earth orbit satellite constellation that will be faster, cheaper, and far more secure than anything that is out there. Think El Elon Musk only a lot better. And I have been at that for eight years. I don't take a paycheck. Uh, I, I, I told the, the CEO I want stock and options. And I told him I really like the stock and options, but I want the movie rights even more because the story of this Leo involves Chinese spies, hypersonic weapons, German scientists and engineers, an eccentric Irish entrepreneur, a bunch of nerds from the telecom industry, weird people with lots of money, uh, and uh, a special unit of the FBI Counterterrorism Division and uh, the Royal Duchy of Liechtenstein. So anyway, you'll, you'll learn more about it as time goes on, but it's a hell of a lot of fun. I don't play golf. I used to play golf, not, not well, badly, and uh, the then governor of Texas said, uh, why don't you come out, you know, a friend of his and a friend of mine, Jim Francis, was coming down from Dallas, and he said, why don't you come and Jim's bringing his 10-year-old son, Jimmy, and why don't you come and play golf? And so I was paired with the then governor, George W. Bush, and we went out uh, and playing golf, and Jim was with his son, Jimmy, and the, and, the, and the rest of the foursome. And about the third hole, the then governor said to me, go back and play with the 10-year-old, you're terrible. <laughs> and uh, then when we were in the White House, uh, I was a, 
uh, the, one of the things in the White House is you, you have uh, the senior aides have equivalent ma uh, military rank. You're, you're either an assistant to the president, a deputy assistant to the president, or a special assistant to the president. And I was an assistant to the president, which means that I had the equivalent military rank of major general, which meant that I could get really good tea times at uh, Andrews Air Force Base golf course. And my then son, uh, who was then 12, said, I want to try golf. So I called up and got reservations. And, and uh, we went out there, and he hit a few balls around. And you know, when I sh showed up at the gate at Andrews Air Force Base, it was like, uh, identification, oh, oh, yes, 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 we have an escort waiting for you, you know, yes, and then like, you park in this special place and it's Major General, you know, three three stars on it and stuff. And this, I can't park there, and that's not me. Oh, yes, the, yes, Mr. Rove, that's your spot. So I happened to mention the next day, the President said, this is on a weekend, the President said, uh, said uh, how was your weekend? I said, well, I took Andrew out golfing. And uh, I don't know if he likes it or not. He said, did you golf? And I said, yes, Mr. President, I, I golfed. And he immediately yells out, Ashley, who is now Ashley Cavanaugh, wife of Brett Cavanaugh, but then Ashley maiden name. And uh, she comes in and he says, uh, uh, take a memo, issue a pre presidential finding that Carl is not allowed to play golf on any golf course in the continental United States or a territory or in any country with which we have a bilateral or multilateral defense agreement. <laughs> that was the last time I took up a golf club. Hi, thank you for the amazing talk. Um, hi, thank you for the amazing talk. I'm Eric, I'm a uh, fellow here at Buckley. My question was, what was your most memorable policy-making experience? Thank you. Um, that, that's a hard one to answer because um, the, 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 the years that I was the Deputy Chief of Staff for Policy were really hard for me because I couldn't express an opinion. My job was to get a process going where people would speak candidly about how they, what they thought about an issue. And I had to be the neutral guy. Now, I got to express my opinion at the end, but this may shock you, but I tend to have an opinion. And so having to stifle myself and was, was a challenge. I really enjoyed it. But I mean, that was one of the great things. Senior, senior aides to the White House, uh, senior aides to the president, their tenure is an average of 18 months. I was there seven years. I had colleagues who stayed all eight. And one of the reasons was it was such interesting work. And, and, and the President of the United States went out of his way uh, to make it thus. Because he knew one of the things was that place is awful powerful. I'd have members of Congress sitting in my office and they'd be saying, you people are screwing it up. The President's I, I can't believe how bad you're handling this issue, and so and so is a complete moron. And if I had five minutes with the president, I'd tell him what the you know he's doing wrong on this, and I'd say, well, he got a free, free ride now. Why don't we go across the hallway and say hello? And they'd walk in and, hey, Mr. President, how you doing? How's Barney? Oh, Laura looks great, Mr. President. You're looking great. No, I just happened to be here talking with Carl. You know. Nothing on my mind. You're doing great, Mr. President. You're doing fantastic. <laughs> I'll tell you one other. Putin. Putin comes to the White House. First time that we, that, that we knew that he'd ever been there. He may have been there before. But uh, my office was right next door. There are only two meeting rooms in the West Wing. The cabinet room, which you see when the president is meeting with the cabinet or members of Congress. And then the Roosevelt Room, which is right across from the Oval. My office was just to the west of that, right next to it. And Putin is in there. This is when he is supposedly the number two. You know, he's got, he's got uh, Dmitry is in there as the, as, the, as the leader of Russia. And uh, he's like the number two, so, which is obviously not true. But uh, he's in there. And the guy's about this tall. And he's like Tony Soprano with no charm. Strutting around, you know, like, hey, I'm cool. I'm, you know, he speaks impeccable English, but doesn't like to let you know that. So he's in there in Russia. He's mocking. I know just enough Russian to know that he's mocking. He's pointing at Theodore Roosevelt, and Theodore Roosevelt's Congressional Medal of Honor hangs on the wall in the Roosevelt Room, and he is mocking it. And uh, the 
the, the diplomatic aide opens the door. There's a door, there, there's a door there, which if people come in and out, door there, people come in and out. And there's a door over in the corner of the room, which literally leads right across the hallway into a door into the Oval. So the diplomatic guy comes and says, uh, uh, Mr. Putin, the president is ready to see you. And they take him across the hallway. Now, I didn't follow him, but the president told me later, he walks into the Oval Office for the first time. There it is, the beautiful Oval Office. Got the HMS Resolute desk given to us by Queen Victoria, used by every president except one since. Beautiful sort of cream-colored, butter-colored rug with the great seal of the United States. Floor to ceiling, windows on the south and the east side. The east side looking out on the rose garden that's in bloom. The south side, you can see the Washington Monument. And if you, you look, if you step at two, a couple of steps to the left, you can see the Jefferson Memorial and a beautiful National Mall. And there's, you know, beautiful fireplace, the, the picture of George, the, uh, George W. the first. And, you know, and it's beautiful. And Putin is, over to, is overcome and says, oh, my God, in English. That's what the place is like. And that, that, that affects decision making. So when I was the deputy chief, you know, one of the things you had to do was keep your opinion to yourself because you're in charge of the process. And Bush wanted to be in a place where people would come in and sit in front of him, two couches, and, you know, there'd be Condi Rice on one of them arguing blah, blah, and there'd be a, you know, deputy from level three of the Department of Widgets and Gadgets on the other one, and we'd be discussing some esoteric trade issue. And if the deputy numbered level three did a good job of making their case, the president would say, you did really good. And as a result, that person would spend the next six months given, you know, let me tell you how hard I'm going to work. But that, that was... Um, that was the most interesting time I had, but it was also the toughest. I am, incidentally, I have to say, I have become the, the, a, an expert on the uh, Hugius Grotus uh, theory of the definition of seaward lateral boundaries, which consumed a lot of my time, which was the big fight over how we were going to divide up oil revenues on the, on the, uh, from the Gulf of Mexico because Trent Lott, as long as he was there, was going get to get Louisiana screwed and Mississippi uh, an unfair share, and I had to be the guy just telling him about the theory from 1619 of the theory of seaward, the definition of seaward lateral boundaries. I'd be happy to get into detail on that. I'm sure you'd all be as excited as I was, but uh, it, it was really an interesting and lots of interesting things to deal with. And strange things. I'm, this low Earth orbit satellite constellation, one of the reasons I'm involved in it was they, they came to me because they heard the last recommendation of the 9-11 commission to be uh, implemented involved a question of spectrum, and I, I spent two years battling the bureaucracy over it. Eventually won, but shouldn't have spent two years. Here and then back there. Yep. So apparently American politics is divisive. Um, is that an exceptional strength for, an Amer for America, or how do you view it? is one, one part of the question. The second part of the question is, if there's one thing that you could change in American political dynamics, what would you like to see yeah. change? Look, we're going to have disagreements. The thing I worry about is that we, that, that we can't be respectful in our disagreements. Because if you're disrespectful, I mean, it, it war, it, it, people are people. And if you're constantly insulting them, and if you're questioning their intentions, it makes it difficult to go on to the next thing. We, we ought to find a way to disagree more agreeably uh, and treat each other with greater respect. If I had one thing I could do, it would, and, and it's not going to happen, I'd do something about social media because I, I think it, it, it brings out the worst in people. It, first of all, it makes us prone to um, incredibly stupid rumors. There was a vote this weekend at CPAC and something like 70% of the, of the participants in the straw poll said Michelle Obama is going to be the Democratic nominee. We've got this weird theory running around that, you know, Michelle Obama is going to be the nominee of the Democratic Party. You know, I, I, I literally got summoned to the White House on May 20th of 2020 to tell Donald Trump, President Trump, that he, that he should go ahead and attack Biden 
and not buy off on the theory that if he attacked Biden too much, they were going to that Obama was going to re- step in and replace Biden as the nominee with Andrew Cuomo and Michelle Obama was going to be his running mate. And I'm sitting there telling the president of the United States, Mr. President, that is just simply insane. First of all, Barack Obama and Joe Biden don't like each other. Just go read Joe Biden's White House memoir and see what he thinks. And Michelle Obama, go read her memoir. She hates politics. She didn't want her husband to run for state senate or U.S. senate or president. And the idea that she would somehow say, I'm going to be a candidate for vice president of the United States is absurd. But this is what social media does to us. Let me just tell you, Taylor Swift is not engaged with that, you know, that guy on the football team because she wants to get Joe Biden elected. She likes the big football guy. I mean, it's like, please. But social media seems to bring out the worst. I, 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 I tend not to read. I have 600,000 Twitter followers. Who are these people, and when are they going to get a life? <laughs> and, and I don't read my feed because I go on there, and somebody is saying something incredibly insulting and weird, and it's like, I don't have time for you. People email me at my general mailbox, and, you know, if, they, if they're, you know, F-bombs and blah, 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 blah. I tell them I don't want to hear from them. And if they repeat that, I tell them, thanks so much, but I'm blocking you. But we've got to, as a country, find a way to be respectful in our disagreements because it does not help our country over the long haul. Sometimes we're right, sometimes we're wrong. Sometimes we'll be in a position to have our way, and sometimes we won't. But it does not help our country for us to act like children and, and suffer bouts of verbal incontinence in dealing with our people on the other side. I intend to use that in one of my upcoming columns. I'm just waiting for the right moment. Verbal incontinence. I don't know how I stumbled, <laughs> but it seemed like a pretty good one. We had, here, here we go. Uh, I saw you were born in Colorado and went to school in Utah. What has drawn you to Texas so much? Uh, I got married to a Texan. Marriage didn't last, but, but I felt like I was home. Texas is a great state, and uh, um, I, I feel very fortunate. I live in the, blue, the little blueberry in the middle of the Big Red Sea. Uh, Austin, Texas is a pretty liberal town, but, uh, and it surprises people that I've got you know, sort of commie pinko friends, but it's home, so what the hell. Incidentally, I was born in uh, St. Joe's Hospital, December 25th, Christmas baby, and uh, same hospital that John Kerry was born in, and it irritates him every time I remind him of it when I run into him. <laughs> you know, do you remember? We were born in the same hospital. Yeah. I, I said, yeah, I remember you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Rove. Um, I just wanted to talk quickly about former President Bush. Mm-hmm. wanted to see if you've been keeping in touch with him lately, and what he's kind of been concerned about uh, besides maybe painting? Um, So uh, the simple answer is yes. Uh, And I can tell his mood because the earlier in the day that he texts me or calls me, the more riled up and agitated he is. And uh, the last couple of weeks have been 6.30 a.m.s. So yeah, no, we stay in touch. And uh, He's, uh, yeah, he is painting. I'll tell you a story about the painting, but uh, more important than that is he's doing a lot with uh, veterans. He, uh, there's probably not a week go by that he doesn't see uh, veterans, whether it's wounded warriors or families of those who lost someone. He takes it very personally. He sees it as an ongoing responsibility. So he spends a lot of time with veterans. He's very active in um, things that have to do with AIDS in Africa, PEPFAR. Um, 25 million people are alive today in Africa because of the generosity of the American people and providing them drugs through PEPFAR. And uh, this is particularly important to him. He's also, you know, look, he doesn't, he doesn't want to, you know, his attitude is Israel will get it right and we'll both be dead. So who, who cares about it? So he's not out there trying to, you know, sculpt his, you know, the vision of him, which saves him a lot of time. Uh, but also, uh, he wants to do something to inspire younger leaders. So there's a program called the White House Fellows Program, which is really terrific. I used to be on the Regional Selection Committee for the White House Fellows Program and uh, uh, worked with a number of them at the White House. But it's limited. 
So he got together with his dad's library and with the Johnson Library and convinced Bill Clinton and Obama to join them, and they now have a presidential uh, leaders program, a pre presidential fellows program for young leaders that's, that's not as onerous as the White House Fellows. White House Fellows, you literally leave, you have to leave what you're doing, whether it's to your profession or whatever, and go to Washington for a year. And this program, you're, you have to take time off in order to go to the libraries for sessions on leadership, but he's very involved with those, with those uh, young leaders. And, uh, and he's involved politically, but behind the scenes. He just doesn't think it's seemly for a former president to be out there trying to scream and shout and dance about. So he talks to people when they call him. He welcomes seeing them, gives them candid advice. And, uh, but he's not, you know, he's not, he's a very content person that doesn't feel like I need to be in the front page of the newspaper, which is, a, I think, a healthy sentiment. So I was a bachelor very terrible bachelor for a while. And uh, I got remarried. And my wife is a particular favorite of 43 and Laura's. And we had a gigantic wedding, three people, um, me, and my, my, me and my son and Karen. And, uh, but we did have 80 people for dinner. So we sent an invitation to the former president, not expecting that he would come. And I get a phone call, got the, got the invitation. Don't know what she sees in you, but we're coming. <laughs> We do me a favor, get Beth, his barber, come to the country club half an hour early. I need a trim. His barber's in Austin. He lives in Dallas. Figure it out. And uh, okay, we'll get that done. He says, and uh, going to give you a gift. I got, I got a gift for you. I said, Mr. President, not our first, not registered anywhere. Just come. Don't, don't worry about the gift thing. He said, no, 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 no. Now remember, this is like, this is like 12 years ago. So we are talking a lot because I was on a board doing some stuff with the library. And so we're talking a lot. And, and he says, you don't know that this is about me but I've taken up painting, and I'm really good at painting dogs. I'll paint your dogs as a wedding gift. Now, back then we had two, and, uh, and uh, so for the next 10 days, I'm getting stupid emails. Uh, I need a picture of Nan and Bob from the right. I need Nan and Bob from the left. You say Bob's a chocolate lab? This isn't chocolate. I need, I need Nan standing up. I need Bob lying down. Bob, whose original name was Reba McIntyre. There's a story there, but anyway, forget so finally, after about 10 days, I get this email from him saying, making really good progress, think you're going to like the final product. And I emailed him back and said, thank God you didn't follow Churchill and take a brick lane as well. <laughs> so wedding comes, he shows up half an hour early to get his haircut, walks in with this gigantic, elaborately wrapped package, and doesn't say anything, puts it over there on the corner on the desk and, and gets his haircut. And we're chit-chatting about things, and Laura's there, and Karen, and... Then we go into the reception, and people are arriving for a drink, and he literally puts it on a table so that everybody sees it but doesn't say anything about it. And we, everybody's getting a drink, and it's time to go into dinner. And so, of course, he does the, you know, you know, and got a little something for the bride and groom. Karen, don't know what you see in him. <laughs> and Karen opens up the package, and it's elaborately wrapped. He's apparently got an infinite supply of White House gold, you know, wrapping paper. But anyway, she opens it up, and we've got the, uh, our White House photographer friend, Eric Draper, is taking pictures, and he's got, he gets the picture. And it's Karen opening up, and it's like, wow, that's really good. And I'm standing next to her, and I'm like, shit, that's really good. And he's, sitting, he's standing about five feet away, hands in his pockets, shoulders sort of slumped over. And you can just read the bubble above his head. I'm good. I'm really good, and you didn't know it, did you? Anyway. I now have five Bush paintings, and I had to get them insured. I pay almost as much on the insurance on those as I pay on my house. And it's, anyway, grateful for it. Thank you for being here. Um, so I'm an undergraduate, and a lot of us are trying to figure out what our life's task is to be. When did you know that you wanted to enter the political arena? Was there a specific moment? Uh, I, I can't remember the moment, but it's always been there. I, uh, I uh, you know, remember the first time you had to write a paper in your first uh, civics or government course, course in like the fifth grade, you know, our three branches of government, or, you know, the Declaration of Independence. I wrote my thesis on the theory of dialectical materialism. I didn't know who this guy Marx was, but it seemed to me he was an awful bad guy. 
So I've always been interested in government and history and politics. And like a lot of you, I suspect, uh, you're affected by a teacher, and I was. Eldon V. Tolman. He was my high school teacher. He was everything I was not. He was a Democrat. I was a Republican, though I come from a very apolitical family. He was a Mormon, and I was in a high school with 95% Mormons, and I was an, a Presbyterian. And uh, I was not cool. May be hard to figure that out, but uh, you know, I had hush puppies when they weren't cool, and I had a briefcase and a pocket protector, and you know, nerd. And uh, uh, I took one course from him, and he was really tough, and he was very formal. Called everybody by their, you know, Mr. Smith, Miss Jones, never called you by your first name. And I signed up for a second course from him, and he said, um, uh, Mr. Rove, uh, everyone uh, in the course will be able to achieve an A by satisfactory completion of the coursework, except you. If you want to get an A, and that's about all I had going for me, you must get involved in a political campaign. So I went down to the headquarters of our U.S. Senate candidate uh, in, uh, in Utah and showed up at the headquarters, and there was a guy there, and he looked ancient, but he probably, in retrospect, was in his late 30s. And he said, what are you doing? Why are you here? And I said, want to get an A, and here's what my teacher told me. And he said to me, do you know what a nail gun is? I said, I have no idea. He showed me what a nail gun was, and I spent that Saturday nailing yard signs in the back giant room in the headquarters. He said, good work, come back next week and bring a couple of your pals. So next weekend, I got a couple of my fellow nerds to go and we spent the day doing that. He said, great, you're the chairman of Freer High School of Students for Bennett. And come back next week and bring a few more nerds. So we all showed up the next weekend. He says, you're the county chairman of Students for Bennett. And we ended up having a lot of fun. So. Some people came in from the Republican National Committee to sort of see you, to check out the campaign, and they saw us doing our stuff. And so two years later, between my freshman and sophomore years in college, I got a call from the Republican National Committee saying, would you like to go to Illinois and organize college students? I was 19 years old, and I got my first paid job in politics, all because Eldon V. Tolman said, if you want an A. And Fast forward a few decades, and I'm sitting in the west wing of the White House, and the president says, we've got to withdraw our nominee to be ambassador to Belgium, and we better come up with somebody who can, be, who can be nominated and cleared quickly, because we're in the war on terror, and Belgium is the host country for NATO and for the EU, and so the ambassador to Belgium is sort of like part of a triad, the ambassador to NATO, the ambassador to the EU, and the ambassador uh, to Belgium, and the Belgian the, our ambassador in Belgium has the nice residence, so that's where they do a lot of their coordinating. So you've got to have somebody who's smart and able and, and to do it. And, I, and he said, you got any ideas? I said, yeah, I, I got an idea. I said, here's a guy I know. He was a respected chief of staff for a U.S. senator and then became an aide to, uh, to President uh, Ford. And then he went off and became a lobbyist. And uh, he has advised Reagan, your dad, and you. Uh, he has handled taking a step back from his lobby practice in order to be the unpaid Sherpa to take difficult nominees through the process to get them confirmed by the U.S. Senate because he's so well respected. And he just finished getting your second U.S. Supreme Court nominee approved, Sam, Samuel Alito. I think he, he's sort of semi-retired and wouldn't be a great signal if you chose him because that would sort of say if you step back from making money all the time and serve your country and are a straight shooter always telling people what you think, not what you think they want to hear, there might be a reward for you. He says, great, call him up. So I called up Tom Corlogus, the guy who said, do you know what a nail gun is? And said, Tommy, you want to end your career as ambassador to NATO. Politics is about payback. And it's not the payback of I'm going to get you. It's the payback of trying to find a way to give somebody a chance to participate in the great drama of our democracy. And Tommy Corlogus did that because Eldon Tolman told me if I wanted to get an A to go get involved in a campaign. He, he's 95, just lost his wife. He's a terrific human being and uh, did a great job as our ambassador. Yeah. Uh, if you all join me in, in thanking Mr. Rowe for being here. <laughs>